Okay. <clears throat> the history of barbering. Your lady. The history of barbering. Chapter outline. Introduction. Why study the history of barbering? Understanding the history of barbering. Trace the rise of the barber surgeons. Understand modern barbering organizations and state boards. Consider the state of barbering today. Learning objectives. After completing this chapter, you will be able to discuss the evolution of barbering and the origin of the word barber. Describe the practices of the barber surgeon and the meaning behind the barber pole. Identify the organizations responsible for advancing the barbering profession and explain the function of state barber boards. Recognize the resurgence of barbering in the 21st century and the wealth of opportunities available to the new barber. First, some Arabian wine, freshly squeezed by yours truly. Cold brew, water down because, you know, <clears throat> shit's heavy. Introduction. Barbering is one of the oldest professions in the world. Whether from a sense of aesthetics or because of religion, you know, let me just turn that off. <clears throat> we back, we back. <clears throat> Introduction. Barbering is one of the oldest professions in the world. Whether from a sense of aesthetics or because of religious conviction, virtually all early cultures practice some form of beautification and adornment. Given the archaeological evidence found in painted pottery, early sculptures, and burial mounds, as civilization advanced, so did barbering profession. Develop, developing from its beginnings as cultural and trivial necessity to the art form it is today. Excuse me. Why study the history of barbering? Barbers should study and have a thorough understanding of the history of barbering because barbering is one of the oldest documented professions. Understanding its evolution can provide you with an appreciation of the prominent role it achieved in different cultures throughout the ages. Knowing the history of your profession can help you predict and understand upcoming trends. Knowing the history of your profession can help you predict well. <laughs> Having a clear picture of how modern barbering organizations and regulations developed gives you a better idea of where you fit into the profession at large and what is expected of you as a barber. Understand the history of barbering. After reading this section, you will be able to discuss the evolution of barbering and the origin of the word barber. Barbering has a rich history, stretching back millennia, although technological developments, metal shears, clippers, electricity, have certainly advanced the barber's profession. Its standing within human civilization has been more significantly influenced through the ages by changing traditions, cultural trends, and shifting political influences. Ancient cultures. Archaeological studies from around the world have shown that haircutting and hairstyling were practiced as early as the glacial age. The simple implements used then were shaped from a sharpened flints, oyster shells, or bone animals. Sinud, or strips of hide, were used as adornment to, the to tie the hair back, and braiding techniques were employed in many cultures. Many primitive cultures maintained a connection between the body, mind, and spirit. This conviction translated into a superstitious, <clears throat> turned into, <clears throat> this conviction translated into superstitions and beliefs that merged spiritual, spirituality, religious rituals, and medical practices together in an integrated relationship. For example, some tribes believe that both good and bad spirits entered the individual through the hairs on the head and that the only way to exercise bad spirits was to cut the hair. In another similar religious ceremony, long hair was worn loose to allow the evil spirits to exit the individual. 
Then after ritual dancing, the barber cut at the hair, combed it back tightly against the scalp, and tied it off to keep the good spirits in and the evil spirits out. Belief systems elevated trivial barbers to positions of importance, such as medicine men, shamans, or priests. The Egyptians are credited with being the first people to cultivate beauty in an extravagant fashion. Excavations from tombs have revealed such relics as combs, brushes, mirrors, cosmetics, scissors, and razors made of tempered copper and bronze. Coloring agents made from berries, bark minerals, and other natural materials were used on the hair, skin, and nails. Eye paint was the most popular of all cosmetics, with the use of henna as a coloring agent first recorded in 1500 BC. The use of barbers by Egyptian noblemen and priests 6,000 years ago is, is substan substantiated by Egypt's written records, art, and sculpture. High-ranking men and women of Egypt had their heads shaved for comfort when wearing wigs and for the prevention of parasitic infestations. Every third day, barbers would shave the priest's entire body to ensure their purity before entering the temple. The work of the barber, Mary Ma'at, Mary Ma'at was apparently held in particularly high esteem as his image was sculpted for posterity. I gotta write that down. Where's my notebooks? Yeah, my notebook real quick. <clears throat> That's crazy because I totally feel like a shaman or a spirit, spiritual uh, person without a doubt. Definitely down with all that. Grab this little notebook real quick. <clears throat> Check it out, peace, y'all. Peace in the Middle East, peace in America, peace in the hood. They're killing each other and they're killing us. I love each other, y'all. <clears throat> Mary Ma'at. Definitely sounds Egyptian. Alrighty then, you gotta remember these words. In some African cultures, hair was groomed with in, intricately carved combs and decorated with beads, clay, and colored bands. The Maasai warriors, for example, wove their front hair into three sections of tiny braids and the rest of the hair into a queue down the bark, <clears throat> into a queue down the back. Braiding was used extensively with intricate patterns frequently denoting status within the tribe. So we're gonna go ahead and show these uh, figure one one, figure one two, and figure one three for your viewing pleasure. There's that comb. Yup. Egypt is credited, y'all, having the earliest barbers. We go back to Egypt, bro. <clears throat> Several biblical passages give insight into the state of the barber in the Middle East. According to Leviticus, Moses commanded those who had recovered from leprosy to shave all their body hair as part of a ritual cleansing. Ezekiel refers to another ancient shaving custom when he says, Take thou a barber's razor and cause it to pass upon thy head and upon thy beard. Based on these and the other biblical references, it has been accepted that barbering was available to the general population of the Middle East during the lifetime of Moses. Although Greek barbers from Sicily introduced shears to Rome sometime between 800 and 700 BC, barbers were virtually unknown in Rome until 296 BC. It was in Greece during its golden age, 500 to 300 BC, that barbering became a highly developed art. Well-trimmed barbers were status symbols. Greek men had their beards trimmed, curled and scented on a regular basis. Barbershops became the gathering places for exchanging sporting, social, and political news. 
While barbers themselves rose in prominence to become leading citizens within a social structure. You know, I heard that some things have not changed. <clears throat> the status of the beard in Greece drastically changed in the third century BC when Alexander the Great Macedonian troops lost several battles to the Persians as a result of the warriors' beards. The Persian would grab the Macedonian warriors by their beards and drag them to the ground where they were either speared or beheaded. Alexander issued, issued, <clears throat> Alexander issued a decree that all soldiers be clean shaven. Eventually, the general populace adopted the trend and barbers were kept busy performing shaves and haircuts. Ticinus, Ticinius, Ticinius Mena, that's a name right there, Ticinius Mena, excuse me, of Sicily had been credited with having brought shaving and barbering services to Rome in 296 BC. The men of Rome soon enjoyed tensorial services, such as shaves, haircutting, and dressing, massage, and manicuring on a daily basis, with a good portion of their days spent with the barber. While the average citizen patronized the barber's place of business, rich noblemen engaged private tonsors to take care of their hairdressing and shaving needs. The Romans, ex the Romans expanded the concept of these personal services to include communal bathing and what became known as Roman baths. Clean shaven faces were the trend until Hadrian, Hadrian came into power in 117 AD. Emperor Hadrian became a trendsetter when he grew his beard to hide scars on his chin, resulting in the populace following his lead. And the beard was again in fashion. In fact, the word barber is derived from the Latin word barba, meaning beard. Another word derived from Latin, tensorial, derived from tondere, meaning to shear, Tondere nice. means the cutting, clipping, or trimming of hair with shears or a razor. It is often used in conjunction with barbering. Barbers are sometimes referred to as tensorial artists. Customs and traditions. The beliefs, rituals, and superstitions of early civilizations varied from one ethnic group to another, depending on the region and social interactions with other groups. There was a general belief among many groups that hair clippings could bewitch an individual. Damn. That's good, man. Damn. Bewitch an individual. That hair clippings can bewitch an individual. Hence, the privilege of hair cutting was reserved for the priest. Medicine man or spiritual leader of the tribe. According to the Greek philosopher and mathematician Pythagoras, that's my boy, Pythagoras, the hair was the source of the brain's inspiration and cutting it decreased an individual's intellectual capacity. The Irish peasantry believed that if hair cutting, if hair cuttings were burned or buried with the dead, no evil spirits would haunt the individual. Among some Native American tribes, it was believed that the hair and the body were so linked that anyone possess possessing a lock of hair of another might work his will on the individual. In almost every early culture, hairstyles indicated social status. In ancient Greece, boys would cut their hair upon reach reaching adolescence, while their Hindu counterparts would shave their heads. Following the invasion of China by the Manchu, Chinese men adopted the queue as a mark of dignity and manhood. Noblemen of ancient Gaul indicated their rank by wearing their hair long until Caesar, upon conquering Gaul, made them cut it as a sign of submission. At various times in Roman history, slaves would be allowed or disallowed to wear beards, depending on the, on the, on the dictates of the ruler. Coloring agents were often used to add further dimensions. The ancient Britons, extremely proud of their long hair, bright and blonde hair, with washed a uh, compost of tallow, lime, and the extracts of certain vegetables. Darker hair was treated with dyes extracted and pro pro processed from plants, <clears throat> and processed, hmm, processed from plants, trees, and various soils. The Danes, the Angles, and the Normans dressed their hair for beautification, adornment, and ornamentation. 
before the battle with the Britons. In ancient Rome, the color of a woman's hair indicated her class or rank. Noble women tainted their hair red. Those of the middle, those of the middle class colored their hair blonde, and poor women were compelled to dye their hair back. Much later, during the reign of, Q of Queen Elizabeth in England, it would become fashionable for men to dye the beard and cut it into a variety of shapes. In later centuries, religion, occupation, and politics also influenced the length and style of hair, as well as the wearing or not of beards. Clergymen of the Middle Ages were distinguished by the tonsor, a shaven patch on the crown of the head. During the seventh century, Celtic, Celtic, and Roman church leaders disagreed on the exact shape the tonsure should take. The circular tonsor, called the tonsor of St. Peter, left only a slight fringe of hair around the head and was preferred in Germany, Italy, and Spain. The Picts and Scots preferred semicircular design, known as the tonsor of St. John. After much argument, the Pope eventually decreed that priests were to shave their beards and mustache and adopt the tonsor of St. Peter. Although the edicts of the church maintained some influence over priests and the general populace for several centuries, beards and longer hairstyles had returned by the 11th century. Priests curled or braided their hair and beard until Pope Gregory issued another papal decree requiring shaved faces and short hair. It was not until 1972 that the Roman Catholic Church finally abolished the practice of tonsor. Most rulers, all right, hold on, y'all gotta see these figures. Figure one four, figure one five, and figure one six. I don't know who that dude is. What's he say there? The golden age of Greece saw the rise of barbering as an art along with the well-trimmed, curled, and scented beard. Look at that. Nice. And then you have Roman Emperor Hadrian grew a beard. Oh, yeah, to fight, to hide his scars. Vanity, bro. And that's the tonsor. Uh, St. John and tonsor of St. Peter. St. Peter I. <clears throat> Although... <clears throat> Most rulers and monarchs became trendsetters by virtue of their position and power in society. Personal whim, taste, and even physical limitations could become the basis for changes in hairstyles and fashions. For example, in the 16th century, when Francis I of France accidentally burned his hair with a torch, <laughs> his loyal subjects had their hair, beards, and mustaches cut short. During the reign of Louis XIV in the 17th century, noblemen wore wigs because the king, who was balding, did so. During the 19th century in France, men and women showed appreciation for antiquity by wearing variations of the Caesar cut, the style of the early Roman emperors. The beard and shape. With the razor being such a defining tool for barbering, the history of shaving as well as caring for the beard in general deserves a second look. Since the practice of shaving predates the written word, it is difficult to determine just when this form of hair removal began. Excavations of early stone razors or scrapers from the upper Paleolithic period, 40,000 to 10,000 BC, indicate that early man may have used these tools for hair removal as well as for skinning of animals. By the time of the Neolithic period, 800 to 500 BC, early man had created settlements and begun to farm and raise animals. <clears throat> Artwork of this period shows examples of clean-shaven men, but it is unknown how the hair was removed. In Egypt, however, pyramids from around 700 BC have yielded flint-bladed razors that are known to have been used by the ruling classes to shave their heads as well as their faces, and by 4,000 BC, a form of tweezers was also used. It stands to reason that the nomadic nature of many early groups helped spread the practice of shaving through the rest of the world. Mesopotamians of 3000 BC were shaving with obsidian blades, and by 2800 BC, the Sumerians were also clean shaven. Likewise, Greek men of 1000 BC are seen in works of art visiting their local barbers for shaving services. 
In early times, most groups considered the beard to be a sign of wisdom, strength, or manhood. In some cultures, the beard was a sacred symbol. For example, in Rome, a young man's first shave on his 22nd birthday constituted a rite of passage from boyhood to manhood and was celebrated with great festivity. To this day, among Orthodox Jews, the beard is a sign of religious devotion, and to cut off one's beard is contrary to Mosaic law. Beards have been removed throughout the centuries at the command of rulers and priests. Alexander the Great, as mentioned earlier, ordered his soldiers to shave so their beards could not be seized in the battle. Archbishop of Rouen in France prohibited the wearing of a beard in 1096, spurring the formation of the first known barber guild in France. Peter the Great encouraged shaving by imposing a tax on beards. During the spread of Christianity, long hair came to be considered sinful and clergy were directed to shave their beards. Although the shaving of the beard was still forbidden among Orthodox Jews, Orthodox Jews, the use of scissors to trim or shape excess growth was permitted. Muslims took great care in trimming their facial hair after prayer and, their, and the removed hair was preserved so that it could be buried with its owner. Preserved so it could be buried with its owner. Oh yeah, <clears throat> whatever. Uh, selection of ancient Egyptian barbering tools, including mirrors, razors, and tweezers. In an Orthodox Jew, with his beard and his little curly sideburns. Trace the rise of the barber surgeon. After reading this section, you will be able to describe the practices of this barber surgeon and the meaning behind the barber pole. By the Middle Ages, not only provided <clears throat> by the Middle Ages, barbers not only provided tonsorial services but also entered the world of medicine, where they figured prominently in the development of surgery, surgery as a recognized branch of the medical practice. This prog this progress was the result of the barbers' interaction with the religious clerics of the day, as the most learned, learned, and educated people of the Middle Ages, monks and priests had become the physicians of the period. One of the most common treatments for curing a variety of illnesses was the practice of bloodletting. And barbers often assisted the clergy in this practice. But in 1163, <clears throat> at the Council of Taurus, Pope Alexander III forbade the clergy to act as physicians and surgeons or to draw blood because to do so was contrary to Christian doctrine. Barbers stepped in and took over the duties previously performed by the clergy. They continued the practice of bloodletting, minor surgery, herbal remedies, and tooth pulling for centuries. Dentistry was performed only by barbers, and for more than a thousand years, they were known as barber surgeons. The barber surgeon formed their first organization in France in 1096 AD, and by the 1100s had created a guild of surgeons that specialized in a study of medicine. By the middle of the 13th century, these barbers companies, the, these barber companies had also founded the School of Saint Cosmos and Saint, and Saint Domain in Paris to in, instruct barbers in the practice of surgery. Is that where cosmetology comes from? <clears throat> Gotta write that down. Saint Cosmo and Saint Domain boss. <clears throat> the Worshipful Company of Barbers Guild was formed in London, England in 1308 with the objective of regulating and overseeing the profession. The Barbers Company was ruled by a master and consisted of two classes of barbers, those who practiced barbering and those who specialized in surgery. By 1368, the surgeons formed their own guild with oversight by the Barber's Guild, which, list, which lasted until 1462. Although competition and antagonism likely existed between the two organizations, 
a parliamentary act, a parliamentary act united the two groups in 1450, while it officially separated the practices of each profession. Barbers were limited to bloodletting, cauterization, tooth pulling, and tensorial services, while surgeons were forbidden to act as barbers. The merged guilds became the company of barber surgeons. Figure 110. In 1540, Henry VIII recombined the barbers and surgeons of London through the Act of Parliament by granting a charter to the company of barber surgeons. The company commissioned Hans Holbein, the younger, a noted artist of the time, to commemorate the event. <clears throat> the uh, coat of arms of the barber surgeons, I guess, and the barber guild. I mean, I don't know if this even matters. With the advancement of medicine, the practice of bloodletting became all but obsolete. Although the barber surgeons' medical practice dwindled in importance, they were still relied upon for dispensing medical, <laughs> medicinal herbs, <laughs> and pulling teeth. Finally, in 1745, a law was passed in England to separate the barbers from the surgeons and the alliances was completely dissolved. Barber surgeons had also flourished in France and Germany. Following the formation of the first French Barber Guild in 1096, barber surgeons under the rule of the king, King's Barber formed another guild in 1371, which lasted until about the time of the French Revolution in 1789. Ambroise Par, Ambroise Paré, 1510 to 1590, was a particularly noteworthy French barber surgeon who went on to become the greatest surgeon of the Renaissance period and the father of modern surgery. Finally, many Europeans had become so dependent upon the services of the barber surgeons that Dutch and Swedish settlers brought barber surgeons with them to America to look after the well-being of the colonists. Um, okay. The barber pole. Uh, the symbol of the barber pole evolved from the, the technical procedures of bloodletting performed by the barber surgeons. The pole uh, to symbolize the staff that the patient would hold tightly in order for the veins in the arm to stand out during the bloodletting. The bottom end cap of the modern barber poles represents the basin that was used as a vessel to catch the blood during the bloodletting. The white stripes on the pole stand for the bandages that were used to stop the bloodletting and were hung and were hung on the staff to dry. The stained bandages would then twist around the pole in the breeze, form, um, forming a red and white pattern. One interpretation of the colors of the barber pole is that Red represents the blood, blue the veins, and white the bandages. Later, when the company of barber surgeons was formed in England, barbers were required to use blue and white poles, and surgeons red and white poles. <clears throat> it is also thought that the red, white, and blue poles displayed in the United States originated in def deference to the nation's flag. Modern barbers have retained that barber pole as the formal symbol of the business and profession of barbering. In fact, display of the barber pole at an establishment that is not a licensed barber shop employing licensed barbers is prohibited in some states. <coughs> Henry the seventh, not the eighth, talking about barber guild. And then check that out, barber poles. <laughs> Understand modern barbering organizations and state boards. After reading this section, you will be able to identify the organizations responsible for advancing the barbering profession and explain the function of the state barber boards. By the end of the 19th century, the profession of barbering had completely separated from religion and medicine, emerging as an independent profession. During the late 1800s, the profession structure changed and it began to take new direction. The formation of employer organizations known as master barber groups 
and employee organizations known as journeyman barber groups was the first step towards up upgrading and regulating the profession. During this era, the emergence and growth of, the, of these organizations helped establish presidents and standards that are part of today's barbering profession. Union shop. Man, that's crazy. Check that out. We found our unions. Here. <clears throat> A noteworthy example is the Barbers Protective Association, organized in 1886. In 1887, it became the Journeyman's Barbers International Union of America. At its first convention in Buffalo, New York, affiliated with the American Federation of Labor, by 1963, the name had changed again to the Journeyman Barbers hairdressers, cosmetologists, and proprietors, International Union of America. Passed in 1897, the first barber licensing law set standards for sanitation, minimum education, and licensing requirements for barbers and barbershops in the state of Minnesota. The setting of standards was important because at the time it was common for towels, shaving brushes, and other barbering tools to be used on more than one customer without being disinfected in between. These practices provided ample opportunity for bacteria, parasites like head lice, and infections like ringworm and herpes to be spread from one person to another, casting a bad light on barbers and barbershops in general. Similar laws that included hand washing and power and powered rather than stick estrogens, regular floor sweeping and the disinfection of tools were soon passed in other states in response to the need to protect the public from infectious conditions. Awareness of the importance of cleaning practices and preventing disease became so widespread that the terminal method systems was enacted in 1916 in New York City. At the time, it was common to see barbershops, beauty shops, and other small businesses enterprises at the main railway terminals in larger cities, the terminal methods system outlined strict disinfection and cleaning practices, such as boiling tools in a view of customers and using airtight storage for disinfected implements. The system soon spread to other shops thoroughly throughout New York, providing customers with the superior sanitation services. The Associated Master Barbers of America was established in Chicago, Illinois in 1924 eventually expanding to include beauty salon owners and managers and changing its name to the Associated Master Barbers and Beauticians of America. In 1941 by 1925, its members had established the National Educational Council with, with the goal of standardizing and upgrading barber training. The council successfully set down the requirements of barber schools and barber instructor trainings established in a curriculum and promulgated the passage of state licensing laws. Working in cooperation with the AMBBA, the National Association of Barber Schools, formed in 1927, developed a program that standardized the, the operation of the barber schools themselves. In 1929, in St. Paul, Minnesota, the National Association of State Boards of Barber Examiners was created to solidify the qualifications required for barber examination applicants and the methods of evaluation to be used. Finally, by, the by 1929, the AMBBA adopted a barber code of ethics to promote professional responsibility in the trade and later published its own barbering textbook. Since 1929, all states have passed laws regulating the practice of barbering and hairstyling. The state board are primarily concerned with the protection of the health, safety, and welfare of the public. They do this through the maintenance of high educational standards to assure competent and skilled service, the licensing of individuals and shop and enforcement of infection control laws. Many of today's state barber boards meet up to twice a year as members of the, N of the National Association of Barber Boards of America. The NABBA established the month of September as National Barber Month to recognize the contributions of barbers to society, according to the NABBA's website, the organization's mission statement and objectives are as follows. September is Barber Month. Learn something every day.
my answers. <clears throat> According to the NABBA's website, the organization's mission statement and objectives are as follows. The National Association of Barber Boards of America represents over 300,000 barbers and, it's, and is the icon of the independent business person. The tonsorial arts have been tradition have been a tradition in the United States of America since, since its inception. The time-honored tradition of the neighbor barbershop continues to grow and prosper. Additionally, the organization proclaims the following objectives. To promote the exchange of information between state barber boards and state agencies examining licensing and regulating the barber industry. To develop standards and procedures for examining barbers. To develop standards for licensing and policing the barber industry. To develop curriculum for educating barbers. To promote continuous education in the barber industry. To develop and promote procedures for ensuring that the consumer is informed and protected. <clears throat> Consider the state of barbering today. We're almost done. Bro. We're almost done. Very done. <clears throat> In this chapter, we discuss the progression of barbering from prehistory through the regulatory agencies of the 20th century. As a profession, barbering has risen from the from its localized tribal beginnings to provide indispensable haircutting, styling, and shaving services across the globe. Barbers have served as surgeons, dentists, and wig makers. The profession has been shaped by advances in technology through the centuries, from the earliest years to the manual clippers of the 19th century to the high quality electric tools and social media available today. Barbers have continuously had to respond to trends and political developments in order to maintain their profession and their livelihoods. Some of these changes have presented challenges. Kings who, main, who mandated the wearing of wigs, for example, while others have served the profession in beneficial ways. Some noteworthy imp improvements to barbering over the past century include the following. Implementation of regulatory and educational standards, improved hygiene and cleaning practices in the barbershop, availability and use of better implements and tools, mandatory study of anatomy, dealing with the head, face, and neck, study of products and preparations used in facial scalp and hair treatments. As a student of barbering, you are now a member of this profession. With its long and established history, the past 50 years of which have experienced more changes than the history of organizations and standards alone suggest. The 1940s and 1950s represented the heyday for American barbershops, with many men visiting their neighborhood shops every two weeks to maintain a clean cut appearance. However, February 9th, 1964 marked a symbolic but critical turning point in the barbering industry. On that night in New York City, the British boy band, The Beatles, appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show, helping cement the cultural and social bedrock of long hair revolution for men in America and the world. This revolution in style also linked various political movements, the hippie subculture resistance to the Vietnam War, with hair left long and shaggier. Barber services, while still needed during and after the 1960s, were called upon less through the coming decades. As standards of male grooming relaxed and the skills required to cut long hair were more readily found with hairstyles, with hairstylists, barbershop culture itself also became less attractive to younger generations of men associated as it was with the conservatism of their parents' generation. As longer hairstyles became more mainstream and less associated with social or political ideologies, there was a rise of unisex salons starting in the 1980s, which further trend, tr threatened the livelihood of barbers, pulling clients, away, pulling clients away with the offer of fast and cheap hair services. On the other end of the spectrum, full service salons and spa rocketed in popularity in the 1990s, drawing even more men away from the barbershops. So deluded that the profession seemed to have become around this time that some states chose to move away from barber-specific licenses in favor of general cosmetology licensing. However, after the turn of the century, a resurgence in barbering took place. New schools opened in many states, along with the barbershops, both independent and franchised. The salons and spas of the 1990s had lost their attractiveness, and barbershops could offer an atmosphere more geared to the male consumer. 
Though that should not discount the diversity of the barbershop of barbering had been gained since the 1950s, according to the National Barber Museum, by 1985, over half of all the barbering students were women. Even today, the number of female clients continues to climb, with some shops claiming as many as 30% of clients being women. Economic fluctuations further helped barbershops rebound in the 2000s. By the recession of 2008, barbershops made up an attractive middle ground for consumers who could no longer afford high-end salons but were interested in more than what lower-end unisex shops offered. Barbering has received an even stronger boost in recent years from the flourishing of an art of manliness and a reconsideration of what male style means. The grunge of the last decades had has given way to a return of the of the dapper aesthetic, the clean lines and controlled styles of the 1940s and 1950s. This change has highlighted the importance of the barbershops in providing necessary upkeep. The year 2010 saw a massive return of beards and beard designs on young men, accompanied by a, a concern for facial grooming as part of a larger interest in cultivating personal styles that includes hair, body art, clothing, and more. Creative young barbers have joined their peers in the profession in an increasing numbers. With new barbers up 10% in two years, barbershops have developed to reflect the interest of their barbers and clientele by paying homage to earlier periods and traditions of barbering while integrating advances in technology and new techniques into the shop environment. The barbering world you are entering is a vibrant, diverse, and culturally relevant as the profession's long history suggests. Barbers are increasingly recognized for their creativity and their craft, and barbershops remain important pillars of the, com of the communities, both on the street and online. At the same time, while barbers today actively forge new traditions from old in the pursuit of style, it is important for them to remember their responsibilities to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public, to maintain and enhance standards, to continue the quest for knowledge, and to advance this great and lasting industry. And let's drop that. <clears throat> and then there's a timeline over here. I'm gonna go through all that. Cause this starts in 500 BC, with Egypt and basically talks about all the stuff that I read in this chapter. History of Shears and Clippers timeline, 700 to 600 BC, Stone Age early cutting tools of bone, flint, antler, and shell are produced. Uh, earliest Clippers in the Middle East. I don't know, y'all got the book. I'm gonna do chapter two tomorrow. It's for personal use, but if there's anybody out there watching or listening, like and subscribe. I can help myself.